Good evening from the city of Brighton in UK, where I'm visiting my granddaughters again in quarantine at my daughter's house. Nice to have you today. For Thank you for joining us. I um, have a very interesting guest. I interviewed him for the radio show last week, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a bit short. I wanted to talk to him at greater length. I'll introduce you to him in a moment. But meanwhile, thank you for joining us. Um, a couple a couple slight housekeeping mem- memos. Um, we are going to go every other week, beginning after Thanksgiving. I'm going to take next week off, and then we're going to do this every other week. And we're going to shorten it a little, like 35, 40, 45 minutes, that sort of thing at, at the most, um, because I think that's uh, just makes sense for the editorial product and for the length of time we watch people watching on YouTube, etc. Um, I'm also going to go every other week with a newsletter, so your mailbox won't get flooded with that. Uh, as I get busier over the in the new year, um, I think every other week will provide a, a better quality uh, uh, product. At any rate, my guest is John Kretschmer. He is a to say he's a sailor is an understatement. Um, he is the author of a book called Sailing to the Edge of Time, which has just come out in paperback. His hardback came out a couple of years ago. It's now out in paperback, and it's a, a vivid, very well written account um, of his days uh, sailing the seas of the world. Not that they're over; he does. He's still doing it. In fact, we're going to reach him in uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands on the island of St. Thomas when we bring him on the air in a few minutes. Uh, so we're going to talk about his couple of brushes of death he's had while sailing. Both are very scary and talk about the joys of sailing on the sea, which is a whole lot different than taking a sailboat out on a lake or uh, uh, for the weekend, as I as I mentioned in my uh, promotion for this event. Um, if you do read uh, get my weekly newsletter, you, I had a quote from his book, which gave you an example of the uh, the quality of his writing, his, his uh, ability to describe things and take you there and put you on his boat, on his sailboat, on those seas. So we'll meet John Kretschmer in just a moment, but... Uh, as I often do, I'd like to open with a bottle of wine. And uh, this is a wine that my daughter had when I uh, uh, arrived here in uh, England a couple, a few days ago. It's a Cremont. Uh, if you don't know what a Cremont is, it, it's spelled C-R-E-M-A-N-T. It is uh, generally made in France. It's a sparkling wine, but not produced in Champagne. As you may know, and we've talked about this in the show before, only... Bottles of wine produced from grapes from the region of Champagne, about a 50-minute train ride from Paris. Only wine from that region can be called Champagne. California can't call it sparkling wine Champagne. New Zealand can't. Any Well, sparkling wine is made all over the world, including the United States. Um, and in France, there are eight regions or appellations in France that produce, produce Cremant, one in Luxembourg as well. And this one happens to come from the region of Burgundy, which we've talked about a lot. Um, so this is a Cremant de Bourgogne. Now, as you all know, I don't speak French, so pardon me for all pronunciation, but this is a bottle. So it's a sparkling wine. I already opened it because I had some for dinner uh, with my, it's now uh, three minutes after eight in uh, in the UK. Um, so I already had dinner and uh, as you'll see, it's very, looks like champagne, fizzes like champagne. It doesn't have quite the same amount of fizz. Um, and depending on what region the Cremant is from, what Appalachian, uh, the grapes may be different, um, uh, depending on where the Cremant is, is made. Uh, there isn't a village in Burgundy that doesn't produce Cremant, and I didn't know that till I did a little research on this. Uh, it's generally made with Chardonnay or Pinot Noir, because Pinot Noir is the red grape of uh, Burgundy, and, uh, and Chardonnay is the white grape of Burgundy. In fact, last week when I talked about uh, a Chablis, I think I, I said it was made from Chablis grapes. There aren't any grapes called Chablis. That's the region of Chablis. And all Chablis is, or almost all Chablis is made from a, um, from the white Chardonnay grape, which of course we're all very familiar with here in the United States. We're familiar with Pinot Noir as well. But Pinot Noir is the red grape of Burgundy. So you can make, so you'll get a pink, you can get a pink Cremant, you can get a, a clear, a, a golden one as you see right here. Um, this comes from a producer whose name is, uh, Francois Martinon, and his uh, v- vineyard is located just outside Bonne, B-E-A-U-N-E, which is sort of the capital, the official capital. It is the capital city of, uh, of Burgundy, uh, the biggest city, biggest town there, and a very charming town it is. Um, they've been growing grapes on this property since the 19th century. Now, they got a problem in Burgundy because the cost of grapes are going up so high that Cremant is generally considered a less expensive cha- than Champagne. But the cost in, in Burgundy of grapes are going up so high that uh, they're getting close or above champagne prices. 
And that's the problem. Now, if you get a Cremant from Bordeaux on the other side of France, on the western side of France, um, and but by the way, and all these are made with what's called uh, méthode traditionnelle, traditionnelle, I guess you'd pronounce it in French. Again, pardon my French, I don't speak French. Um, it's, it's really the traditional champagne method, but it's called méthode method traditionnelle. And you will see that, that uh, title on sparkling wine from California too. It just means they make it in the method of the same method the champagne makers uh, create theirs. And, and, and over in Bordeaux, you'll find that the grapes most often used to make sparkling wines are Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon, a couple we are uh, certainly familiar with as, as well. Um, there are about 500, uh, uh, 500 vineyards in the Bordeaux region that grow wine, uh, grow grapes that are made for Cremont. Um, and it's, it's really undergoing a, a, a big demand these days. Um, all the grapes used in sparkling wine are in the Cremont in, in Bordeaux must be handpicked, and the wine has to be aged for a minimum of 12 months uh, before it can be called Cremont, Cremont de Bordeaux. Uh, they recommend uh, folks who know about more than about this, uh, more than I do about this, suggest drinking it within one to five years after you buy it. And uh, the, the actual Cremont can, can be dry, it can be a little bit dry, it can be a little bit sweet. Um, almost like champagne. So I'm going to try a little flavor here and describe it to you. <clears throat> Sorry, I haven't had in a while, the bubbles. Close to champagne, but different. It'd be fun actually to get a bottle of champagne and a bottle of Cremont from Bordeaux or Burgundy or anywhere else in France and put them side by side and have a tasting with friends. You know what this is great with Japanese food? With sushi, with uh, salads, with fish, um, it's you know people tend to think of sparkling wines and, and champagne as as special occasion only, or you know birthdays or celebrations. All good, all a good idea. But you can have this with dinner. In fact, I remember when we were shooting our public television show in Champagne many years ago, went to a restaurant and all four courses were accompanied by different champagnes. Uh, you can imagine how I felt after that. Okay, so that's it for the wine of the week. It's by Francois Martineau. M-A-R-T-E-N-O-T. -E it's a Cremant from Burgundy. Quite good. I think a Cremant from Bordeaux, which I have had too, could be equally good. Uh, <clears throat> here's our pitch for following us on social media. If you don't get my newsletter, just go to maxatours.com and scroll down to the bottom of the page and you will get it now every other week. And it's short, punchy stuff. I'm not selling you anything. When we start some tours, I may mention them, but it's not a sales pitch. It's a newsy thing about travel this week, who's letting Americans in, who's not, changes in frequent flyer rules, all that kind of stuff. I try to make it bright. I try to make it fun. So go to maxatours.com, scroll down to the bottom of the homepage, and you'll see a place to just put in your name and your email. And of course, it's free. And if you've missed some of our previous, um, uh, I was just thinking segments, uh, webcasts, they're posted on YouTube. And you can go in and type in Rudy Maxson, and Paul Thoreau, Rudy Maxson, and Andrew McCarthy, Rudy Maxson, and Rick Steves, Rudy Maxson, and Samantha Brown. And in about 24 hours after this, you'll be able to type in Rudy Maxa and uh, John Kretschmer, my guest, guest today. You'll find them there. Um, as I said, John is the uh, author of the book, Sailing the Edge of Time. Uh, John, why don't you hit your camera and come on in? There's a, there's a copy of his book, and this is John. We're reaching you. Hey, Rudy. In Thomas still, you still there where we talked last week? Yeah, still, uh, still anchored off St. John in the Virgin Islands. Where do you nice call place. home, John? Uh, that's a good question, Rudy. <laughs> it should be easier than uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale. It says on the transom of our boat, but we keep moving. We have, um, we I've been traveling my whole life. You know, with with the onset of COVID here, this was my longest stretch in the United States in forty years. Um, it was six months in a row. Um, so I've been on the move most of my life, but we uh, we lived in Fort Lauderdale. My wife was a teacher there, and we're also in Maryland when we're in the States because my sister has a boatyard there. And You're on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, close to where I lived in Washington, D.C. for 40 or 50 years. So I certainly know yeah. Annapolis and uh, the Eastern Shore. And, uh, yeah. We're down in Solomon, if you know where that is. Just I south know the Solomon Island where some people still, they still anybody have a British accent still? <laughs> they still do some of the old timers. It's a this lovely is, place. In fact, there's an island uh, off Annapolis or off in the Chesapeake near Annapolis called Solomon's Island. It's it's traditionally been an island for fisher fishermen, and it was settled by English people long ago. And some people have stayed there so long, there's still a trace of the British accent 
when you go and talk to folks who live there. I was fascinated the first time I went. I didn't believe it till I actually went. Okay, so Fort Lauderdale and uh, and the Eastern, or the, excuse me, the Chesapeake Bay of Maryland. What started you in sailing as a sailor? Um, yeah, I was. Um, you know, it's funny. We grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Detroit mostly, right in the city. wasn't much of a of an ocean going person, but I I sort of fell in love with sailing from books. My mom was a great adventurer. I ended up teaching her to sail when she was 60 after my father passed away. And she and a friend sailed around the world in a 38 foot boat. And I just became obsessed with sailing and and uh, was kind of an indifferent student in college to put it differently. After I flunked out for the fourth time, my mom said to me, you know, I know you're not as stupid as you seem to be. You should, uh, maybe I'll make you a deal. And the deal was if, if I worked hard for a year, whatever I made, she'd match as long as I bought a boat and took off. <laughs> so at age 20, I got a little sailboat and shoved off, and I've been sailing ever since. You shoved off from where? Lake Erie? Uh, so we actually, it's a funny story. I The boat was, I bought it on Lake St. Clair in Detroit, and I had just enough money to ship it down to Miami. Uh -huh. And so I started from Miami completely not no i mean a complete novice i mean i had to sail out the miami river and i had no engine on my boat and there were seven bridges i had to raise and it was a, it was an adventure just making it to the sea and what was the size of that very first boat it was 27 feet and what's the size of the boat you're, you're sitting on you're sitting on down there in st thomas so the boat right now quetzal is a 47 foot cutter <laughs> um yeah so I've kind of edged my way up in the world. It's a, it's a fantastic boat, this boat. She's, uh, we've sailed her the equivalent of about six or seven trips around the world. And she's just been a, a really fantastic boat. So, and when you say we, who is we? So we are right now mostly my wife, Taji, and I. And also I have this cool business, Rudy, where people join me for sailing passages, for expeditions. Um, and we've launched some really serious trips in high latitudes and crossed the Atlantic numerous times. It's really the ideal business because my clients are invariably pretty interesting folks who become great friends and pay me to do what I really like to do. <laughs> and how, and do. You take them along on segments. They don't have to go all the way around the world. How, how what, what length do most people stay on board with you? And they're learning, by the way, right? I'm, you're teaching them. Completely, yeah. They're, I call them training passages. Um, and they're very real. You know, you come aboard and you stay on watch no matter what the weather. If it's blowing a gale and it's, you know, you're on watch and you need to reef the mainsail and get out on deck, you do it. It's a real serious adventure travel program. The average trip is about 10 days. Okay. Um, and they, it might be 10 days on a voyage up to Newfoundland or, you know, from, from New England down to the Caribbean, or it might be an Atlantic crossing. And we've got some really big trips scheduled for next year if the world kind of cooperates. <laughs> In fact, on your website, you call it the big one. Right, yeah. And so why my wife's so impressed. She says, you know, you're a writer and that's all you could come up with. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> why is it called the big one? Is it bigger than any other sailing you've ever undertaken? You know, in a way it is. Um, I sort of cut my teeth a long time ago with an epic voyage as a young man around Cape Horn um, that at the time we established some records. They're pretty much littered with asterisks now, but it was a coming of age voyage. And um, I've kind of wanted to get back there. I see it as a capstone of, of my all this lifetime of sailing. So the big one is going to take us to latitudes far to the north, Greenland and Labrador and up the up the Arctic coast and then all arc all the way back down to Cape Horn before we get out into the Pacific. So it's a it's wow. a pretty serious voyage. Yeah, a big one. <laughs> and what uh, uh, Cheryl, uh, one of our uh, viewers asks, what is the youngest age you would accept on the board? Well, it's interesting. I, the ages range dramatically. Um, the youngest person that's ever sailed with me is 16. The um, the oldest is 77. I had a 77 year old cross the Atlantic with me and he was fit as a fiddle. So for me, it's less about experience and more about kind of what you bring to the table, um, your attitude, your sense of adventure. We always have a mix of people on board, some real experienced sailors, some inexperienced sailors. But we put together this really, really functional, fun cruise and have these great adventures. 
How many people, can, how many other than you and your wife, how many people can be aboard your uh, sailboat? Usually four or five. It depends four, how five. how greedy I am. Or sometimes if people come as couples, we sort of squeeze you into cabins. But no, life's good aboard Quetzal. And, and we're also great aficionados of wine. <laughs> oh. We never miss captain's hour or underway. So. Oh, you have a stellar on your boat. Um, is your... Uh, <laughs> Let me ask three questions. Uh, Yahazel is asking, is your boat equipped for scuba excursions? Um, do you sail with a tabernacle on your mast? Do you prefer single or double masts? Jeez. Uh, okay, can you answer all those real fast? <laughs> those are great, great questions. Um, we're not really set up for scuba. We do lots of snorkeling, and it's, our world is more designed for sort of rugged offshore sailing. And when we get coastal places we explore, we just found it easier to sort of go to local scuba operators than it is to carry our own gear. Secondly, because we're kind of a deep ocean boat, I mean, Quetzal's spent a lot of time thousands of miles from land. The mass is very well fixed. So tabernacles are super cool. Taji and I spend a lot of time in the French canals. When we're not doing ocean passages, we organize canal boat trips. That's why we know we're great lovers of fan, uh, great lovers of wine, especially in Bon and Bourgogne. But um, those boats there have tabernacles, so the mast can come up and down. What is a tabernacle for those of us who aren't seamen? A tabernacle is kind of a structure where the mast hits the deck, and it allows the mast to be pivoted down onto the deck. So if you're on the Canal de France, for example, and you have to go under the low bridges, right. drop the mast. Yeah. And then uh, I've had lots of boats. I've had catches, which are boats with two masts. Um, and I've sailed boats with catches all over the world uh, or sell catches. And I really like them. However, Quetzal, our current boat is a sloop, one mast with a staysail stay that makes her a cutter. And that's probably the most common rig you see today uh, for boat sailing offshore. Do you have a pilot house, he asks? Ah, cool question. Not technically, but almost. We added a hard dodger. So the dodger is the structure that goes over the cockpit of the boat. And, um, when I was a young guy, I used to brag about taking waves in the face, and I actually wrote articles saying, you know, anyone who has a, a Dodger or a pilot house is, is, is missing the essence of it, and, and now I've changed my mind. <laughs> in fact, I call the, the top on the boat the T-top for the Taji top, because <laughs> Taji was a big proponent of it, and it was a great move. <laughs> All right. Now, you have had two brushes from your book that, as I remember, two brushes with death. I mean, I, I don't want to be overly dramatic, and I'm not being overly dramatic. And the first one was when you were a young man. How old were you? How old were you? How experienced were you? Were you? And tell us what happened. I was young, and I wasn't very experienced. Um, but it was the very beginning of that Cape Horn trip. We set off in a tiny boat. It is a 32-foot boat to sail from New York to San Francisco by way of Cape Horn at the bottom of South America. And in doing that, we would become the first American yachtsman to ever sail against the wind around Cape Horn. And we would recreate the route of the clipper ships. That was kind of our big deal. Can I, can we I got, interrupt you, John? Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Is going around the Cape Horn, I know going around the Cape of Good Hope below South Africa is a very treacherous thing. The seas meet and it's a big mess. Is, is it a similar situation in the Cape of uh, uh, the Horn? It is. It is. Cape Horn probably would be considered by most sailors to be the, the Mount Everest of sailing. Okay. Um, the reason is, and Cape of Good Hope is a close second, but Cape Horn is perched down at 56 degrees south latitude. There's nothing south of it but Antarctica, and there's nothing west of it until you get to New Zealand. So it's a huge fetch where the waves just come roaring across the Southern Ocean and they funnel between Antarctica and Cape Horn. It's a 400 mile wide pass. So what made that voyage noteworthy for us is that we were sailing from the east to the west against the wind, punching into those big seas in that little tiny boat. But it almost didn't happen because early on, the very, I mean, the first week of the trip, we encountered a tropical storm off Bermuda. And um, I was kind of, I was stupid. I was not really using great sailing strategy, and I was a little scared and nervous, and a, a wave just struck the boat at exactly the wrong time and knocked it over. And we went over to a point where the mast was probably maybe 150 degrees down, and I was pitched over into the sea, and the boat didn't actually roll all the way around. It did this weird underwater pivot, 
And when it came up, I was not too far away from it, all ensnared in the lines, and I was able to free myself and climb back onto the boat. Um, Day or night? Middle of the night, of course. Oh. All the bad stuff happens at night. <laughs> And uh, you said in your book, it really, you looking back on it and as, as, as much experience as you have now, it was, you had a very narrow window to get back on that boat and you're lucky you did. Yeah. You know, it was such a powerful wave um, that it knocked the boat over with so much force that there's little railings on a boat. They're called stanchions and they have lifelines. The boat went over with so much force. Those little railings were bent flush. So climbing back onto the boat, it was a little boat, and I was a fit young guy. I was able to just pull myself over. But the wave just washed over the boat. And I can remember this hissing sound as it was just the white foam all around the boat was just going. So I was kind of in this slick for a fairly long time. I mean, at least, you know, things really slow down in those moments. And it seemed was probably 30 seconds. And, yeah, I wasn't actually scared until I was back on the boat. And then I could just feel my body tremble. <laughs> and you were how old? 23. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And who? how many other people were on the boat? Just one. And um, she was down below. And she was pinned to the ceiling at the time as the boat rolled over. And she thought for sure that I was not going to be back aboard when she fought her way out. And in fact, the boat, we had this Dodger where we were just talking about came down and it crushed itself and blocked the companionway. So it was impossible for her to get out or me to get in for a while. We had to oh. free up all of that. Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty serious night <laughs> for sure. And then there was a time many years in the future when you sailed into a little revolution going on. And I mean, jet fighter planes, bombs. Yeah, Tell that was that. Not, and you didn't that know was, it. That was not my smartest move either. <laughs> um, but we were sailing from Sri Lanka. We had, I was delivering a boat from Sri Lanka across the Arabian Sea to the Red Sea, and then we were headed up to Cyprus. And we were making a call in at Aden, in the port of the port of Yemen, Aden. It was a famous, famous port in its day. It was uh, all cruisers went there, and a great history. It was the port of Sinbad. But um, unbeknownst to us, there was a I mean, kind of a developing coup taking place. And this was not an Islamic thing. It was a, it was a moderate Marxist government that kind of welcomed travelers in, was being overthrown by a hardline Marxist government. And this skirmish turned into a full-scale civil war. I mean, they ended up having, I think, 12,000 casualties in this two-day war. It really was a, a mess. And we anchored in the out, outer harbor because we were kind of pinned down by this gunboat. And the, really the crazy thing was I had brought with me this massive Yemen flag as a courtesy flag because it was the only one I could find. It was like three by five, and it turned out to be the wrong one. Oh. <laughs> it was, yeah, so we looked like we were patriots. You chose but, the wrong uh, team. Huh? We chose the wrong team. But and we, uh, yeah, we managed to... It was a terrifying moment of all the things that have happened to me because there were 10 yachts in the inner harbor. We had were forced into the outer harbor because we got there as it was developing. And the yachts in the inner harbor had to abandon their boats. And they, they went on to a Russian freighter who the Russian freighter or the captain said, we don't know what the hell's going on. And he steamed out of the harbor. We were too far away to even consider that. So we followed the Russian freighter. Um, at the last minute, this one of the gunboats kind of broke ranks and came right alongside us. And yeah, it's funny. I I I, I can picture it so clearly this day because there were two men on board, two young guys, heavily bearded. I can picture them, and they swung the gun. One guy went up to the bow gun, sat behind it, pointed it right at the boat, right at us. Oh. And time really stopped. And you talk about feeling just innate fear. And you were standing in the open. I was standing at the wheel, um, motoring, going as fast as I could, trying not to pay attention to him. And our eyes locked on each other. They did. And uh, Yeah. And, you know, I I don't know. I always think it was just this, this human connection that we make because the man and we looked at each other. We were about the same age, maybe early 30s. And... Um, got up, spun the gun around, and the boat steamed away, and we kept going out of the harbor. 
And uh, yeah, it was just one of those moments where he decided not to blow us to smithereens and you realize that your things hang by a particle sometimes. <laughs> now, this was not a Shiite Sunni thing. This was a, 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 a liberal Marxist yeah. and, a, and a tough Marxist fight, right? Exactly. Who, won, yeah. who won, do you know? Uh, yeah, the extreme Marxists won. Um, and then they eventually were toppled as the, the region became so unstable. But yeah, it was, um, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting because we ended up making our way to Djibouti um that's where we sought refuge and the russian freighter dropped off all the crew of the yachts in djibouti and a couple of them stayed with us and one of the fellows who's a, who's a real famous sailor today is he's an australian guy named trevor robertson um he actually went back to yemen hired a local boat took him back and in the dark of night essentially took a rotten old dinghy into the harbor and got his boat which ironically was named salvation jane and he sailed it out of there. So at the end of the day, our boat and Salvation Jane were the only two boats that escaped. Yeah. Have you been the to the port of Aden since? I have not been back, and I would like to go very much. You know, I have this weird, I mean, and I know it's absurd, but I wonder if, if that guy remembers it as clearly as I do. And to think that maybe we could have a cup of coffee somewhere would be kind of a nice, nice little circle to make. It's completely crazy, I know, but it would be awesome. <laughs> well, one of the pleasures of reading Sailing to the Edge of Time is your writing. So feel free to take a few minutes and wax philosophically on why sailing is so important to you, what you take away from it, how it's affected your life, how it affects your life right now. Tell us about it. I appreciate the question. I, sailing is really important to me. It's um, uh, I've always viewed sailing as, a, as kind of not an escape in any means, but as a as dropping into the world. The ocean is a wilderness, and we're kind of raised up with with land philosophy about how you know you go into the, the, the you go into the woods and you go to the mountains. But when you're out in the middle of the ocean, it's very much a wilderness, and and you have to be resourceful and respect your own. Uh, capabilities and your own limitations. One of the great things about the sea is it's really revealing. There's nowhere to hide and and time grinds to a real grudging movement during a storm when you just want it to pass and you feel things so intensely. And as I've gotten older um, and I just keep sailing, I mean, I've logged a crazy amount of miles, uh, probably as many as anybody, and I find myself loving it more than I ever used to. Uh, I I just realize that those moments have a lot of power. They mix serenity with eternity in every moment at sea. It's crazy, but you're in this environment that, you know, the deck edge is the edge of your world, and yet you feel free and alive. And I recognize that I've been one of the lucky ones to live my life in this place. And I've been able to share it with people and I, maybe it sounds corny, but it, it's coming from the heart for me. I really, I like sailing more than ever, which I think is an interesting place to be when you've been at it this long. <laughs> it doesn't sound corny at all. Do you race at all? I don't. Um, you know, I was a, a college athlete. I was a pretty, pretty good athlete in high school. Um, and that's how I went to all those different colleges on different athletic scholarships. And I just kind of burnt out on sports completely. <laughs> So I viewed sailing more as a, uh, in a more philosophical and adventure terms instead of competition. Please give our, uh, our, our viewers your website. So it's, it's uh, johnkretschmersailing.com. Um, pretty easy. The Kretschmer is a weird name to spell. It's S-C-H-M-E-R. Um, and then if you just Google me, typically you can kind of find your way into my world. Um, and yeah, it's been great chatting. And, uh, By the way, this is not John's first book. It's, it's, is this your third book? This is my fifth book. His fifth uh, that, book. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote a book about that Cape Horn trip long ago. And then, um, yeah, I keep writing memoirs. Eventually, I'm just going to run out of things <laughs> to do <it> myself. <laughs> the book is called Sailing the Edge of Time. Now, now, do note, if you're going to his website, the unusual spelling of Kretschmer. It's right here on the screen for you. It's uh, there's no Z involved, number one, and uh, you can see it right. K R E T S C H M E R John Kretschmer.com. Um, 
John, I, I really appreciate your joining us. Um, I, I, I'm just uh, in awe of how you've um, structured your life. Very envious as a boring old land guy uh, <laughs> to hear about your adventures. I mean, I have sailed on boats, but I'm, I still, even though I've taken sailing lessons, I still can't figure out how to catch the wind. So I'd be absolutely useless on your, on, on your round the world trip. But if you're interested in sailing with John, you'll find information on his website. And uh, I'm sure you'll have a great time and let me know how it goes. John, thank you, uh, to you and to your wife allowing you to take this time and, uh, and, and sit down with us for an interview. No, Rudy, I, I think you'd be great on board because we put a lot of value on stories. <laughs> well, I can, handle, I can handle, you know, I could pour the wine. I mean, I could pretend I was a <laughs> game, you know? Stories and good wine, they go a long way on it's all. So. And we both Thank like you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, John. Take care. You bet. Thanks, Rudy. All the best. Cheers. You too. Have a good sale next year. Bye-bye. Thank you. Before I say goodbye to you, let me just give you a couple uh, a couple of news items in case you don't get my newsletter. Um Francis Par uh, Paris's De Gaulle Airport surpassed London's Heathrow for having the most passengers for the first time in a long time. Heathrow and uh, Heathrow has always been the uh, the most transited or most uh, had, had the most passengers passing through it um, in Europe, and Paris has uh, passed it. Um, Heathrow said it's because Paris has COVID testing capability, and Heathrow says it's been asking the London the British government to give it. Uh, um, authority to have COVID testing and hopes to do so uh, in December. Uh, what else have I got in news? Let me look here. No, oh, I think it's over here. Hang on. Uh, oh yeah, you, the, the 737 MAX is back. I think the first flight is uh, the end of December. It's going to be an American Airlines flight flying between Miami and New York. Nobody, none of the airlines are making a big deal about it being the 737 MAX. For example, in the safety, you know, that safety brochure you get in the back seat in front of you in every plane, it just says 737. There's no max on it. Um, the uh, Poland's airline called Enter Air calls their 737 max a 737 8. Nah, put that max on there. Um, United became the first uh, airline to offer free COVID 19 testing uh, between Newark and London on Monday. And a couple of days later, American Airlines and its alliance partner, British Airways, announced a program allowing U.S. passengers who were headed to the United Kingdom, as I did last week, uh, to administer a free COVID test, 19, uh, test for COVID-19 in your home 72 hours before departure. You'll get another test from a medical professional upon landing in Heathrow, and then you can test another one uh, in your privacy of wherever you're staying the third day. And if you don't think some airlines are serious about kicking people off for not wearing masks, um, uh uh, Delta has kicked 550 people off in the last uh, since last since uh, the first of since the first of September alone, just for September, October, and half a uh, half of November, they've kicked 550 people off. So wear that mask. All right, this is the new abbreviated version of I was just thinking. We're not going to be too tough on the time. It's not always going to be 33 minutes. That is, I see my computer telling me it is now. It could be 40, could be 45, could be 30. But we promise you interesting guests, and we really, really appreciate you. Uh, joining us. Um, check out, uh, sign up for the newsletter at maxatours.com and go to YouTube and just type in uh, Savtrav49 and you'll see a lot of my interviews with past guests. And if if you have friends who are sailors who saw who did not see this interview with John and you would like to send it to him, it should be up by Friday evening, US time on YouTube and you can uh, send it off to them then. Thanks very much. We'll say goodbye for now and I'll look forward to seeing you uh, well in two weeks and have a lovely Thanksgiving.